Welcome everyone. Great to see so many faces um, here this afternoon. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge country. I'm on Wurundjeri country of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded and it is and always will be Aboriginal land and pay respects to the elders past and present on all the various um, First Nations that you are on. Um, and any First Nations people here in the room, pay respects to your elders past and present as well. So my name is Kirsty Albion. I'm the Executive Director at Australian Progress and we exist to build the capacity of civil society to win campaigns. So this is a very critical moment. And we're very excited to host Australia at Home alongside Essential Media, um, Principal Co, The Guardian, Australian Conservation Foundation and the Community Council of Australia. It's great to see so many people here. We've got 150 dialed in and if you can um, put your video on for the next little while that would be great so we can see all of your faces. Um, I also recommend if you can go up to the top right corner you can there's nine little squares um, that's gallery view and then you can see everyone. I'm um, going to great and down the middle at the bottom you can see the chat um, Jess has just introduced herself and um, Rebecca has just introduced herself as our tech support. So if you have any issues with your sound or anything over the next hour, you can message in the chat. But otherwise, if you could introduce yourself to everyone, say your name, if you're part of an organisation or a movement, um, introduce yourself um, in the meeting. That would be wonderful now. So in the bottom down the middle, you can introduce yourself now. Um, otherwise, uh, a few other ground rules will be recording today. So this will be available like all the other Australia at Home um, sessions um, on the website. So you can look at it afterwards um, and look at some of the old ones as well. Um, we'll encourage you to keep your video on and we'll keep you muted most of the time, but there will be lots of time for Q&A. So if you have questions or comments at any time, please chuck them in the chat. And when it's question time, we'll throw to you and you can answer your question via video um, or via the chat. Um, and a few other ground rules, we are um, still learning how to use the tech, so any issues, um, please apologise um, in advance from our team. But otherwise, I'm very excited to hand over the session today to Saffron Zoma, who heads up the Australian Democracy Network, to have a very important conversation with us all about how um, we know that corporate Australia is using this moment of crisis to capitalise um, to warp our democracy away from the interests of people and planet to line their pockets with profits. So we're going to learn about what's happening at the moment and what we can all do about it. So Saffron, I'll hand over to you now. Hi, thanks Kirsty. Hi everyone. Um, I'm calling in, no, Biscuit from um, Boon country today. Um, and I'll just say at the top that I, I have three children homeschooling and a puppy at home. So the chance of me getting through this hour without being called away is pretty small, but I'm gonna do my best. And I'm just acknowledging that lots of us have varying challenges at the time. So if you wanna pop an emoji in with your introduction to let us know how you're feeling, that would be great. A fist if you're excited for this conversation or a vomit emoji is probably closer to how I'm feeling about quarantine at the moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, as Kirsty said, my name's Saffron. I'm the Network Director at the Australian Democracy Network. And if you haven't heard of us, that's probably because we only launched in March this year. Um, but you will be hearing lots more about us um, as the home of a bunch of amazing collaborative pro-democracy campaigns um, over the next few months. The network is a collaboration between the Australian Conservation Foundation, the Human Rights Law Centre and ACOS. Um, and we're partnering with a whole bunch of different um, campaign organisations on around pro-democracy issues. I'm so sorry, I'm just stopping the puppy from getting electrocuted while I'm talking. Um, so just to kick off this conversation before I hand over to uh, fellow panellists, we're all um, dialing in from home, obviously, because we're in the middle of a pandemic that's completely unprecedented in our lifetimes. And to respond to this extraordinary situation, our government has had to take some really extraordinary measures and ask extraordinary things of us too. It's a crisis situation that so clearly calls for leadership. At this time, we really need an effective government that we can trust. 
and the government needs our trust to be able to navigate through this situation effectively too. Um, so that context makes it really important and unfortunate that voter satisfaction and engagement with politics in Australia is in free fall at the moment and has been for some time. Um, this is documented by a whole range of research. For example, the Grattan Institute found just a year ago, I think that 85% of Australians um, think that at least some of our politicians are corrupt. And if you can think back that far, the last thing that was prominent in the news cycle before COVID hit was sports rots. Um, so there are a lot of reasons, I think, why our democracy isn't fully living up to all our hope for it right now. But a big part of it is that the exercise of power in this country has been captured by special interests, um, particularly big business and industry lobbies. And so much of the way we spend public money and set the rules in this country is designed to increase their profits and not to serve the well-being of the many. When I worked at the Australian Conservation Foundation, I ran a big research project um, to prepare to set up a new democracy program there. And as part of that work, I interviewed a, a really wide range of experts and stakeholders to talk about the challenges facing our democracy. And everyone pretty much agreed um, across the board that the influence of big money was their number one concern. So it doesn't matter if you're trying to regulate guns and protect communities from gun violence or regulate pokies and minimise the damage caused by gambling or get action on climate change. The primary obstacle in the way of progress is a big corporate lobby. So that's what we're going to talk more about today how powerful interests, and particularly in this case, the gas industry, are setting themselves up to make a massive profit from the pandemic recovery at our cost. Um, before I hand over to my awesome fellow panelists, I just wanted to make one more point, which I also think is really important. Um, and that is that before COVID struck, 2020 actually had already brought us an unprecedented global crisis. Um, from California to Brazil, massive tracts of land were on fire. There's an unprecedented global fire season. And of course, in Australia in 2020, a mind blowing um, swath of the Eastern coast was burned down, destroying regional communities and costing countless lives and homes and livelihoods and choking our cities on smoke for weeks. Um, and it's very likely that the pandemic and its economic after effects will run straight into fire season 2021, which comes earlier and earlier now, of course, because of climate change. So the stakes for how we uh, plan and execute the recovery from coronavirus really couldn't be higher because the economy and the energy system and the welfare safety net that we build now are not just gonna support our recovery from this crisis, but be the baseline from which we face the challenge of the next extreme weather crisis um, and the one after that. And unsurprisingly, the people who are now trying to divert the reconstruction to increase their own profits are the same gang who have prevented our government from taking action on climate for over a decade now. So I think this is a really important conversation and to give us a little bit more background, I'd like to hand over to Alice. Alice, I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure thing. Thanks, Efron. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Alice Drury. I'm a senior lawyer at the Human Rights Law Centre and have been working closely with Efron and getting the network up and running, which is really exciting. Um, I've been working on this issue of corporate money in politics uh, and its influence for a few years now. Um, I first started working on it when I was at when I was at Get Up, actually, um, and it really just seemed to be the consistent reason why we couldn't make headway on a lot of the progressive issues that we were looking at. Um, and somewhat fortuitously, um, my time at GetUp coincided with uh, a really significant attack on the ability of civil society organisations to advocate um, by the federal government using electoral laws, particularly using um, donation um, reforms. Obviously, lots of folk in our sector uh, rely on donations. Um, so reforms to donations, particularly when they relate to your ability to advocate, can be really devastating. Uh, a bit of a, so we had a big fight about that. That's a different story. We won the fight. We can still go out there and campaign on our issues. Um, but one of the really interesting things that happened from that is we ended up 
with a really strong coalition of civil society organisations representing really, really different interests um, that were um, sort of coming together and beginning to talk about why they also can't make, get any traction on their issues, be it, you know, gun lobbying reform, sorry, gun reform, or, you know, uh, big alcohol, big tobacco, big sugar, to fossil fuel um, and, and bank reform and that sort of thing. And what we were realising is because all of these enormous organisations are contributing to a system um, that entrenches their power in our politics. Um, and that's why we couldn't get any traction. Just before I go on though, I should probably double check, Saffron, did you just want introduction at this stage? I've kind of dived in, but... Um, no, I reckon, um, I reckon keep on diving on in and we'll come around to the others when we'll you... We'll come around? Yep. All right, Did cool. Sorry, all. Um, look, there's, there's not much else to say except that, you know, we've been, I've now been working on this track for a few years with people like Saffron um, and Jolene at the Australian Conservation Foundation. <clears throat> Pardon me. And it's really important context to understand <clears throat> what laws we have in place that allow, that have, have led to things like this kind of shady um, COVID commission, you know, where did, how did this happen? Where did they come from? Why is it that the government is able to just handpick uh, a bunch of their mates to determine um, the direction that Australia is going to go into when we start to recover from this enormous global crisis? Um, why is it that the bushfires are no longer being talked about and they seem like ancient history? Um, even though they only happened a few months ago. And the more you dig into it, the more you realise how far Australia has to go on this. Um, we are massively behind other democracies when it comes to um, this, when it comes to regulating money in politics. Uh, transparency alone is hugely lacking in our system. So over the last 10 years, um, the Liberals and the Nats have hidden about 40% of their income and the ALP has hidden about 28%. And in the last election, about 30 to 36% of income to the polit major political parties was unaccounted for. Um, that's before we even get into, you know, the Clive Palmer's $84 million donation to himself so that he could run um, his own campaign across the country, massively outspending, um, certainly outspending the major parties, but massively outspending well-established long-standing parties, um, like the Greens, for instance. Um, so I think in terms of the work that we're doing at the Human Rights Law Centre, together with our partners, as I mentioned, particularly with ACF, um, we're pushing for long-standing reforms uh, and we know what they look like. They look like uh, caps on political donations to the major parties or any political party for that matter. Um, it looks like caps on election spending. Um, so you don't get a Clive Palmer coming in and buying a national platform that is unavailable to the rest of us. Uh, and it looks like transparency and lobbying. So we know who is meeting with whom, um, you know, who is getting the major influence uh, and how closely they relate to decisions um, that our leaders are making. Um, so that's a little bit of background in terms of our work at the Human Rights Law Centre and a little bit of context in terms of how it is that we've ended up with the COVID Commission um, looking the way it is and why we're all so concerned about uh, what this means for the trajectory of Australia's recovery. Great, thanks Alice. Um, Lucy, do you want to pick it up from there? Thanks Saffron, thanks Alice. Um, so my name's Lucy and I'm the CEO of 350 Australia. Uh, 350 is a grassroots movement. We're all over the world. Um, and here in Australia, we've got local groups all across the country and our mission is we're building a grassroots movement and we're all about challenging the power of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and so I guess since the start of the lockdown measures responding to the pandemic, uh, we've been really interested in trying to keep track of what the fossil fuel industry has been up to in this period. Um, and I guess unfortunately, but not at all surprisingly, what we have seen is the fossil fuel lobby making a grab for power under the cover of the pandemic. So I'm just going to give a couple of examples of what we've been looking at in terms of our research. And this all forms the basis of a new project we're going to be launching in a couple of days called Fossil Fuel Watch. Um, so a bit of a sneak peek at that. 
And so, yeah, so when I talk about the fossil fuel lobby, I'm referring really to peak bodies like the Minerals Council and Appia, which is for oil and gas. Um, the big coal and gas companies themselves and then there's also an echo chamber of you know the IPA backers in parliament and the Australians and the Murdoch press um, and and what happens is they tend to yeah form this echo chamber all pushing for the same thing at the same time and it's this echo chamber which we've seen really dismantle uh, every attempt at decent climate policy we've had in this country um, and it's been trying to dismantle environmental policy for the last 20 to 30 years. And so what this research shows that we've been doing is that um, at the moment we are really seeing an effort by the fossil fuel lobby to push through a number of really damaging proposals and, and these are not new. So, so what we're seeing is under the cover of the coronavirus pandemic, um, they're putting up proposals which they've actually been trying to push through for years and years. So in particular, they're calling for three things. Um, those are tax cuts for corporations, a slashing of environmental regulation, um, and also the fast tracking of project approvals for new fossil fuel developments. And so what we've seen is at least 36 different proposals for concessions to the fossil fuel industry during this period. Um, and we've also seen about two thirds of them have either been supported or actually enacted by governments at both the state and federal level. So um, this is all happening right now. It is quite an urgent issue that we need to look at and something we really need to consider as we think about um, the need for uh, economic recovery that puts people first. I think we need to be aware of um, what the fossil fuel lobby has been up to. And the other issue I just want to flag is around the uh, National uh, COVID Coordination Commission, which is this body that was set up by Scott Morrison in early April. Uh, it's headed up by a guy called Nev Power. Um, and it's really very unclear what this group is doing. It's operating out of Prime Minister and uh, Prime Minister's office, um, but without any of the usual transparency and accountability measures you'd expect. And it was sort of announced and essentially all these gas industry kingmakers have been appointed. So, so what we've found is that of the 15 commissioners and working group members, seven have strong links to the industry and particularly the gas industry. And, and just to give you a couple of examples, you know, Nev Power is uh, currently the a director of a fracking company, Strike Energy. James Fatsino, who's on a working group, um, is on the board of APA, which builds gas pipelines. Um, Catherine Tanner is the CEO of Energy Australia, which is the largest polluter in Australia. And these are just a few of the many examples that were found. And what's really concerning is this has just been sort of handpicked by the Prime Minister, who has a history of placing fossil fuel uh, kingmakers in um, prominent positions behind the scenes. And there's no clear uh, sense of how they're operating. There's no parliamentary oversight of this body. Um, and yet they seem to be playing a very, very influential role behind the scenes, shaping the economic recovery policies. So there's something we're really, really concerned about um, and looking at how we can start to bring a bit more transparency and accountability to this body. And I'll hand it back to you there, Safran. Great, thank you. And our last panel member is Bryn. Bryn, will you um, introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Bryn O'Brien from ACCR, which is the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility. Um, the man next door has just pulled out his whippersnipper, so I apologise if the sound gets a little loose from here on in, but um, hopefully he's gone around the corner. Um, so ACCR is an activist shareholder organisation. Uh, what we do is we hold really small positions in large listed companies, mostly in Australia. Um, and really, uh, we have a pretty filthy portfolio. So we hold shares in BHP and Rio Tinto, Woodside, Santos, all the big kind of industrial emitters in Australia. And we try to use the tools of shareholder engagement and mobilisation of institutional investors uh, to get companies to, to, to chart a new course um, with pretty limited success. Also want to say I'm dialing in from uh, Wadi Wadi land on Darawal country today. So south coast of New South Wales, beautiful part of the state, but also um, just south of here, absolutely smashed uh, by the, you know, by bushfires over the summer and, uh, and uh, now the massive tourism hit of the pandemic. Um, echoing the comments that have already been made by Alice and, and Lucy around uh, you know, the, the unsurprising nature of, oh, here comes with a sniffer man again, oh no, um, the unsurprising nature of, um, of the, the, the demands that company, that corporate Australia is making uh, uh, of, of government at this time. 
um, there's also almost a pathological lack of ima imagination um, in, in the demand. So companies in Australia and their, their lobbies, so the Business Council of Australia, the Minerals Council, APIA, which is the petroleum industry lobby, um, have a history of, of arguing for exactly these things. And, and the history goes something like this. They oppose decarbonisation. Uh, they argue for corporate tax cuts. They erode workers' rights. They undercut uh, the rights of First Nations people to have self-determination in relation to land. And at best, they have silence on civil liberties. And look, we're seeing most of those things uh, right now. Um, we're also seeing some really interesting stuff in terms of uh, company bailouts. Um, so Qantas, for example, one of the key organisations that has been bailed out by government, occupies a very, very influential space in the Business Council of Australia, the peak business lobby. Um, and Qantas has received some sort of bailout package that we don't fully understand the, the nature and extent of yet. But it does not include uh, a state equity stake in the company. So the, Australia has, has uh, handed over a whole heap of taxpayer funds to, to Qantas, but has not, um, it's unclear what we're getting for that. Um, certainly not in, in the nature of shareholdings. There is no social or um, climate conditionality attaching to any of the bailout package. Um, and we've also seen from the business lobby this really, really um, intentional and clever neutralisation of some of the key demands. So where in Europe we're starting to see uh, really quite forceful linking of uh, stimulus measures with green recovery, with green measures, uh, we've almost seen the neutralisation of that in Australia by the business lobby. So as everyone has mentioned, the appointment of fossil fuels industry kingmakers um, into key positions, people with a, a vested interest in expanding the gas industry in particular, um, they have neutralised any call for a, uh, a green weighted recovery levy, for example. Um, at this point, uh, I sat in a conference call with Nev Power last week, um, and he said, um, in response to a question about climate change, climate can wait until after we've recovered. Now, who knows what that means? Who knows um, how long it's going to take? But we really are in quite um, a, a strange time at the moment. Thanks, Bryn. And I want to um, give the panellists a little bit more time to share uh, some of the research and the thinking that they've been doing. But I thought maybe just for the benefit of those of you who haven't been following this in closely, so, uh, in a great amount of detail, it might be useful to just headline some of the reasons why this political situation is so extraordinary. So obviously federal parliament and parliaments around the country have been suspended for various amounts of time. And in a healthy democracy, that's our primary way of ensuring accountability on our government um, so that members of different parties and the opposition get to scrutinise decisions made by the government that goes through committees, all of these normal processes happen. We have this process called ESTA where we can call public servants and ask questions of them and all of this is um, you know streamed on the internet and anyone who wants to understand the details can follow along um, but a lot of those processes aren't actually happening now um, so the government has a lot less oversight than it would under normal circumstances added to that because of the um, the urgency of the situation a lot of the COVID related legislation is more like a skeleton than a full piece of legislation normally would be. So they've described the outlines of the policy and then they've left it to the relevant minister and his department to fill out that skeleton by the means of delegated legislation or regs, which is a, a way of lawmaking that is inherently far less um, accountable. It just enables much less scrutiny by the public, much less input by experts, less oversight from parliament and parliamentary committees. Um, so that is a huge area of concern and some of these laws are um, you know, involving impositions on our civil liberties, restrictions on people's rights that we would say under normal circumstances, you absolutely would need the highest levels of accountability and scrutiny around those decision making processes. And at the moment, they're not there. Um, I guess the other thing is that there are discretionary funds that have been allocated to certain ministers that are seriously eye watering, like they just put public spending in a normal situation, completely in the shade. It's, it's historical. We've never seen dollops of money given out like this before. And the fact that they're just sitting with a minister who, again, has no procedural oversight that we can have um, input to. 
uh, is really concerning. It's just inherently anti-democratic. And this is not to say that they're not making good decisions or that those arrangements weren't necessary for a time, but it's really extraordinary in the, the scope and the, the import of the decisions that this government has basically taken offline out of the normal realm of accountability. Um, and one of the things that's happened in that process is the setting up of this commission, which um, we, we don't really understand its terms of reference. We don't really understand the process by which the members were selected, other than that maybe they were mates of the Prime Minister. Um, none of the normal good processes uh, that would be followed in a situation like this have been followed, which is why all of us are on red alert. And I think, um, in any democracy, you know, the, the saying that power tends to corrupt. Our, our job as, as citizens is to create processes and structures which um, lead to an exercise of power where corruption cannot thrive. And, and that is not happening right now, which is why all of our organisations are so um, deeply concerned by what we're seeing. And it doesn't help when commissioners go out in the media and say it's going to be a gas fired recovery and that they're going to like name check random um, projects like uh, fertiliser companies in the back of beyond that haven't even been permitted as like the next big thing. Um, so having said that, and I hope that wasn't just telling you all things that you have been across since forever. Uh, Lucy, I wonder if I could hand back for you, to you to tell us a little bit more about the research that you've been doing at 350. Yeah, sure. And yeah, I might just talk a little bit more about the commission, as I think it is a really critical one um, for us to think about and think about what we can do and how we can improve it. Uh, just to give kind of an example that I think really sums it up. Um, so someone shared in the chat, I think a really great piece in The Guardian, which was questioning why is a fertilizer plant kind of top of the list for the recovery? And so in that article, um, and David does a great job of looking at this particular fertilizer plant, which would be reliant on the Narrabri gas project going ahead um, and finds that it's actually being put forward by a business associate and friend of Nev Powers. Um, and so you may have seen a lot of talk of a gas fired recovery, but also a lot of talk of uh, fertilizers and petrochemicals as the basis for a renewed manufacturing um, economic boom in Australia. Uh, so, you know, those industries require gas, essentially. So that is another way of saying a gas-fired recovery. And, yeah, so this um, plant is being put forward by an associate of Nev Powers. Um, on top of that, um, as I mentioned, James Fatsino, who's on the manufacturing working group of this commission, uh, so he's on the board of APA, um, and APA is proposing to build a pipeline connected to the Narrabri Gas Project. Um, and on top of that, Energy Australia, of um, which um, Catherine Tanner is the CEO, also on the commission, and um, they also have a stake in the project. So this is probably where I should say that I'm not alleging any wrongdoing um, <laughs> by any particular commission members or some such uh, defamation disclaimer. Um, but, you know, it certainly raises concerns. Um, it just raises the question, like, well, how are conflicts of interest being managed? Um, and how, you know, there was a mention in the Guardian of a spokesperson for the commission saying, oh, well, of course, people recuse themselves from decisions which um, they would have a conflict of interest in. And I mean, there's no enabling legislation which guarantees that. There's no public log of meetings or minutes or who they're meeting with. Um, you know, another example, I was on the call for the Rio Tinto AGM last week um, and quizzed about what kind of economic recovery measures Rio Tinto would support. Uh, the CEO of Rio Tinto said that um, he couldn't tell us much, but he could tell us that he'd been on the phone to Nev Power and the Commission and they were in discussions. Um, so this is, you know, just a couple of examples of why I think we really need to be alive to this issue and just demanding the kind of transparency we would expect in, um, in a normal time of this Commission. Um, and we know that Scott Morrison in particular has a real history of doing this. So his Chief of Staff is from the Minerals Council. Um, he also has a special advisor, Brendan Pearson, who was the former uh, Minerals Council executive who handed him that lump of coal that he was brandishing around Parliament um, back in the day. And so, you know, I think this is just kind of symptom of a bigger problem, but it is really important because the, the economic recovery measures that we put in place now, just it's so important that they prioritise the people who are most at risk and being most impacted. Um, as opposed to um, creating an excuse to give further handouts to the fossil fuel industry. 
Thanks, Lucy. Um, and everyone, just in terms of process, I want to assure all the folks who are asking what we can do about this, that we are definitely going to come to that. Um, but I think it might be worthwhile just doing, uh, letting um, Bryn and Alice have a little more time to just explain the context and then we will definitely start talking about um, action plans from here on in. So Bryn, uh, do you have anything that you wanted to add to your initial reflection? Uh, mainly just to say hi to our friends from the fossil fuels industry who are absolutely uh, watching, this, uh, watching this call. Um, one of the things about uh, the industry and their lobbyists is that they are so good at their job. They are absolutely relentless. They are there all the time advertising uh, to, um, to the public to say um, that, uh, that, that you know, they're an absolute core part of, of our economy, um, that they are going to be there in, in the recovery and that they are going to help Australia forward. And I think for people who um, don't spend their lives, as many of us do in civil society, monitoring that, this activity and watching it, it may seem innocuous. One example I do want to mention is, um, the gas industries, um, uh, the, the, the way that they are currently lobbying to make sure that new homes that are built um, during the recovery are connected to gas mains, which essentially locks in demand for the next 20 plus years. I mean, there are so many ways in which um, the, the fossil fuels industry and, and corporate Australia are seeking to exert influence at this um, time. Uh, they're so well resourced and they are um, so many steps ahead of us. Um, I think, you know, we've got some ideas at ACCR out about how to uh, shift them uh, and, and how to make uh, things, um, uh, you know, more sustainable going forward, how to realign uh, corporate Australia with the commitments that most of them have still made to their investors and to society to align themselves with the Paris Agreement. But uh, let's leave that until the next part of the discussion. Thanks, Bryn. Um, and Alice, I'll come back to you. And I wanted to uh, give you a task. One of the questions I saw pop up in the chat is a good one from um, Tony asking for a bit more information about what's happening at the state level as well. Can you take that one with whatever else you uh, wanted to add to your initial reflection? Certainly can. So in terms of what's happening at state level um, in the context of COVID, was that the context of the question, Safa? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so in terms of, I can certainly speak to parliamentary oversight at the different state levels. So we've been working on getting Parliament back up and running on a regular basis at federal level um, and also in New South Wales and in Victoria. Um, so just briefly at federal level we've been successful um, in getting a select Senate committee up and running to review the government's decisions um, which has been really really crucial and it looks like we're about to be successful in getting Parliament to fully commit to running as usual. Um, in New South Wales, Parliament had been suspended, um, or regular parliamentary sittings had been suspended up until November, uh, sorry, September, beg your pardon. They had um, put in place a um, committee to oversee the government's response, um, but it still hasn't met, um, and nor is it receiving public submissions. Um, we do have a little bit of good news there, which is that um, uh, Gladys Berridge have been committed to um, looking at putting in more dates for Parliament to sit. So it looks like things are getting better in New South Wales. Finally, in Victoria, um, Victoria did continue sitting, which uh, is Victorian Parliament did continue sitting, which is really good, but they have a fairly substandard committee oversight um, process. Uh, you know, the government's handpicked the people that it wants to receive, wants to um, hear from in oral hearings, and it's not receiving any public submissions and certainly not encouraging submissions for people that it hasn't handpicked. So um, it's a pretty patchy um, record at state level. There are some states that are doing better, for instance, South Australia have a really good committee up and running. Um, but the phenomenon of this excuse of, you know, our decisions are so important that we need less oversight um, has certainly taken hold across the country, including at state level, unfortunately. Um, I think that that is, my read is that that is uh, a very unfortunate but somewhat genuine 
um, attempt by governments to deal with the crisis at hand. Um, uh, but we should remain absolutely on that issue of parliamentary oversight um, because this can't become the new norm where you know, it becomes really easy to um, suspend parliamentary sittings. It is really the only way that we have meaningful oversight over very powerful um, bodies like the COVID Commission that we're talking about today. Um, and just before, so that's kind of at state level, and I'll, I'll just very quickly go back to sort of the work that we do at the Human Rights Law Centre um, to explain a little bit this like murky world and how it works. Um, and in large part, it's, we talk about political donations because they're easy to understand. Um, our major parties, their, their election campaigns are funded by very wealthy businesses and by very wealthy individuals. Um, Labor is, of course, also funded by unions. Um, they are quite different and that unions are funded by members' fees. So I'm going to leave unions to one side, um, although um, uh, you know, many, many people on the right would be jumping up and down about that. But I think political donations means that our politicians are beholden to their donors. Um, this is, sets up a system called clientelism, which is the way that the High Court talks about it. Um, but more than that, it also creates a system where it, these guys have access um, to our politicians on a staggering level. Um, like Bryn mentioned, you know, the lobbying industry, it's a billion dollar industry. It is enormous. Um, and the resources they have to throw at meetings with um, politicians to, to lobby on stuff that seems really, really niche and really, um, uh, you know, hard for the public to even get their heads around. Um, just like the example that Broome was giving in terms of the gas mains connecting to houses, it's just everyday practice for them. So the capacity for civil society organisations to push back against, um, you know, big polluting fossil fuel companies, but also banks, um, big tobacco, big pharma, it's just so incredibly difficult to do. Um, and until we get law reforms, we, we're actually not going to see much progress on any of our issues. This time. I'm very unfortunately, very sadly, um, the conclusion that we've come to. I'll throw back to you, Safa. Cool. Um, Bryn, Tony has a follow-up question, which I'm going to give to you. Are there similar fossil fuel stacked responses at the state level as well? And then uh, Peter has a question. Peter, do you want to um, unmute yourself and take yeah. the talking stick? Have you got me? Yep. Okay, that's good. Which particular one was it, Saffron? I put a couple in. Maybe, <laughs> I, can, maybe I can nest them. Yeah, up to you. I, 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 really, I really wanted to suss out the panel as far as um, democracy and, and the definition of democracy, really. I think there's some pretty basic, very basic things that are wrong in our society. And one of them has got to be a focus on democracy. And I'm not talking about the, uh, uh, about the uh, dictionary uh, definition of it. I'm talking about reality, where everybody has a say in what goes on in their society. And I, I can't see that operating in Australia. I, I can't see it being in our own national interest as well as being in our world interests and nested in with that is the control it's taking in our nation through the stock exchange that's remote investor controlled decision making in our country and and i'm wondering if if there is a future for stock exchanges i mean there's other ways of, of uh, generating capital you have you have socially responsible banks and and they're operating around the world now so I just wonder what the panel thinks. Saffron, did you want me to take that first question at least on lobbying at state level? Um, so, uh, so absolutely, I think Tony asked the question. Um, there are uh, industry associations in uh, you know, every state and territory that uh, lobby uh, exactly for, for these things. It, it, I would say on the resources side, they are uh, stronger than um, on the general business side. That's generally done as, at a at a federal level. Um, but let me, you know, they're, they're, they're connecting new houses to gas mains, um, certainly being done at state level in New South Wales. Um, let me give you a fun little example from West Australia, though. 
um, uh, last week as uh, the West Australian uh, Prime Minister, uh, Premier uh, announced certain easing, of, certain easing of restrictions in that state, he did so at a press conference hosted by Chevron at its offices, featuring a speech and Q&A by the CEO of Chevron Australia um, and featuring um, the, you know, the chief uh, health, uh, sorry, the, the health minister in Western Australia praising uh, companies by name, sort of saying Chevron, Woodside and so on. Um, you know, they've got us back on track. So there really is this total capture of, of the state and, to put, it, to put an even more fine point on it, um, Peter Coleman, CEO of Woodside, hi Pete, if you're um, watching or one of your reps is watching today, um, gave a press conference after the Woodside AGM uh, just a little while ago. Um, and, and he said that um, the reason that West Australia was um, able to start easing restrictions earlier than other states is because we are a resources state and because people are used to following company rules. Now, um, politicians in Australia and particularly in the resources heavy states are also used to following company rules. So yes, absolutely, this is happening. Thanks, Bryn. Um, and I guess you left me with the difficult question, didn't you? Um, so, <laughs> Peter, you asked a big question, so I'm not going to like take on to give you a definitive answer. I think one thing that um, your question touches on is the fact that we don't have a particularly strong culture of civics and democracy in Australia. If you go to somewhere like Greece or France or even the US, like what democracy means to them is so strongly collectively shared. Um, and I, I think that's part of our issue actually in Australia, that that's not part of our culture um, in, in a strong way like that. So to me, democracy is healthy when obviously the power is in the people um, and you know, civil society is vibrant and the interests of people and the planet are at the heart of all decision making and government is clean and fair and open. And I think it's fair to say that um, our current democracy doesn't live up to that ideal, certainly not in every respect, although have to be fair and say there are plenty of places around the world where it's a whole lot worse. Um, I've been reading a bit of Joanna Macy lately, which I highly recommend to you if you're suffering mental trauma from the climate crisis. And one of the things that she writes, which I found really compelling is that, um, and I think it's really true of thinking about politics at the moment, is that we tend to see things in a static view as if our political system was just a picture on the wall. And if we look at the picture and there's something not in it, then it's completely unrealistic to think that it could ever be there. It's just not there. Whereas in fact, we all know that the world is much more like a series of frames in a movie reel. And just because you don't see a thing in the frame we're looking at now, it doesn't mean that it isn't there in a future frame. And everything that we want to create has to be created twice. And it's really come home to me as I've been trying to create this new democracy network that you create it once in your own mind and then you create it again out in the world. And I think it's really on us, all of us who care about this deeply, that we spend the time to think about what our personal vision of a healthy democracy is in detail, what does it what does it look like? What does it feel like when democracy is healthy and working the way we want it to? And then we can start to figure out how we go there together. And if you have a compelling vision, then please like be in touch. Um, I'll ask Jess to share my contact information because that's why we created this democracy network to um, create a home for thinking together about the future democracy we want to have and figure out how we go from where we are now to there. Um, so I'm sorry, that's that's the best I can do on that one. It was kind of a curly question. Um, but look, there are a bunch of people putting questions in the chat that were looking for specific tips from the panel about what we can do as citizens right now without waiting um, to take action, to push back against the man. And Lucy, if 350 doesn't have something to say about that, I would be very surprised. So I'm gonna to come to you first. Yeah, great. And. Um... Yeah, it's a great question. And I think this is a topic which um, is, you know, there can be some hesitancy in, in just talking about it. You know, it's so we're in the middle of a huge crisis and to then um, just talk about the huge vested interests we're up against in dealing with this crisis. Like, you know, it is demoralizing and I'd be lying if I said that I didn't sometimes feel demoralized as well, but I also feel like um, we're at an extraordinary moment. If you look at all the, um, 
community groups and uh, groups who've been most impacted by this crisis, who've been campaigning um, and getting really significant policy changes, which now um, could be around to stay, particularly when you look at um, changes to, um, you know, things like um, uh, New Start and, you know, the JobKeeper Allowance and really, really significant things. And there's been a huge amount of pressure on the government um, to put people first in a way uh, that we haven't really seen for a very long time. So although we do, we are seeing um, this huge challenge in, in terms of vested interests and particularly uh, what we look at at 350 is the fossil fuel industry. Um, there is also like a huge amount of just political space opening up, which I don't think we've seen for a very long time. And, and specifically, I think what we need to do is come together and campaign and, you know, Parliament is resuming this week, so it's kind of good timing for this call. And so Parliament is resuming and I think that gives us a lot of opportunity to campaign for, um, in the very short term, as a matter of urgency, I think a lot of transparency and accountability measures um, for the COVID Commission specifically. Um, but more broadly, you know, there's a huge uh, choice coming up for the government in terms of the, the October budget and, and what kind of economic recovery is put in place at that moment. And when you look around the world, as we've mentioned, you are seeing a really big push by other governments and also by some of the biggest corporations on the planet um, to be thinking about what is going to put people and the planet first in terms of the economic recovery. And so I think, you know, it's really incumbent on all of us to come together and uh, be talking to our MPs, to be um, signing up to campaigns, to be doing absolutely everything we can in this moment uh, to push for the reform that we need. And I, I'd say that although the powers that be seem incredibly powerful right now and they have the ear of politicians, uh, we know that the reforms we're asking for have a huge amount of public support. Um, and so, you know, it's really important that we all come together and campaign for them in this moment. And we know that if we do that, um, you know, the majority of the population will be on our side. And Bryn, do you want to add to that? And then I'll come to a few more specific questions. Um, I will just add something specifically on our relationship with corporations. So uh, it might go a little bit to uh, Peter's question earlier as well. Um, in Australia, we have compulsory superannuation. So where we all put uh, money into uh, superannuation accounts or funds, most of us uh, invest, uh, most, most of us go through a, a superannuation fund that is then managed by, by them. Most of us don't do self-managed super. Um, but when your, when your retirement savings go to a fund, a regular industry super fund, for example, say Australian super, the biggest industry super fund in, in the country, over $100, $120 billion of funds under management, they then go out and invest your money in uh, a range of different things, property um, uh, and um, uh, uh, companies, and in particular, listed equities. So big companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and other stock exchanges around the world. Um, those companies then go on to exert enormous political influence. Uh, so at ACCR over the last three years, we have started to engage with the most powerful companies in Australia about the way they exercise influence and we've specifically engaged with them over climate policy and in doing that we've opened up a conversation between or among uh, institutional investors so superannuation funds and companies about how companies exercise influence uh, and what we've seen is that investors so super funds that are um, accountable to you their members for uh, investments and the performance of those investments over time um, and the way those investments influence the society and the country and the environment that you retire into, that those investors have a bit of a different view about how companies have been influencing government than the companies themselves do. Because most institutional investors, or all credible institutional investors, see that uh, climate change is a really big problem for us and that Australian, uh, Australia's lack of climate policy is a really big problem. So that's an ongoing conversation. Um, if you're interested in finding out more or in, in becoming an activist uh, investor yourself with very small shareholdings, then I'll plug our website at accr.org.au forward slash shareholders. Um, but you know, if you are interested in finding more out, out about activist investment, about persuading your super fund to be more responsible, about persuading those companies in which your fund invests to be more responsible, get in touch because we do have power there. 
Awesome. We have time for one more question. Jade, I'm coming to you. I can't see you on my screen. You must be on the next one along. Can you, can you hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. So my name's Jade Fennell. I'm from the City of Sydney. Uh, work in sustainability and my question and one that our team is pondering at the moment is the stay-at-home call of COVID was powerful and simple and part of it seemed to be linked to national identity as well. Uh, we saw that message repeated across every single channel. It was inescapable. Um, lessons that we also learned through through this COVID process is early action is essential, individual actions have collective results and nations can have an impact on the problem. So my question is, um, what three words, word slogan can we, as disparate organisations and individuals, rally behind? Uh, climate can wait is a three word slogan that I heard today. We don't want that. But we have an opportunity to distill, distill, distill and act in a way that is Australian as opposed to un-Australian. So I'd just say we don't need to solve it right now, but I'd encourage you to take that question into your spaces. And if we can just start there, that would be fantastic. I love the question. I also want to um, suggest that perhaps it was a, a little bit of editorial disguised as a question, which is totally great because it was very um, welcome intervention. Does, does any of our panelists have a three word slogan ready to go in answer to Jade's question or are we going to take that on notice? I'm just loving all the suggestions in the chat. Yeah, me too. We can try a snap poll and then we can um, collectively solve the problem for us. Um, I Wisdom. Think one thing that we've been, I've got a two word slogan. Um, so something that 350 has been talking about a lot at a global recovery is um, talking about a just recovery. Um, there's also talk of a people's recovery. Um, I've also seen people talking about um, building back better, which is also a nice one. Um, but I think we know that whatever it is, you know, it just needs to really give a clear sense of what our vision is, not just what we don't want, but what do we want. Yeah, I would second that, by Lucy, and I'll just also just give a plug to Australian Conservation Foundation that's done some really fantastic work doing a deep dive into messaging um, more around democracy than just around climate, actually. Um, and we don't have that pithy three words yet. We're working on it um, together with ACF. But it, it's really about making people realise that we all have a right to be heard by our government even if you don't have a sports fair, $84 million in your pocket. Um, and it's about expecting representation from our representatives. They're only there because we, you know, we elect them and we need to take that power back. Um, so it's a little bit of watch this space, but really, really looking forward to seeing the uh, suggestions in the chat. Yeah, I'm also really keen to be thinking more about how we um, speak about this in a way that connects with people and, um, I think there's lots of juice to be squeezed out there and I'm, I need to like catch this chat so I can take all of the good ideas and hang on to them. So look, I think that we're coming up to being out of time. Um, obviously, um, there's lots of work we're doing right now and this is a large issue and it's going to take a long time before we have the democracy we want. So the work is ongoing. I really welcome all of you to stay in touch with our organisations because we'll be thinking and working on these issues um, a lot in the coming months. And we obviously won't win without the support of the community and all the wonderful brains and good ideas and engaged citizens um, that we can get our hands on. So um, Human Rights Law Centre, um, 350 Australian Democracy Network, and I'm going to use the acronym because ACCR is too long when you say the whole name. All really love to keep in touch with you all. And for me, the call to action at the moment is really just keep on thinking about what, what those future frames of our movie reel should look like and how we are going to move towards that hope that we have together. A lot of it is still kind of TBC, um, but we'll make the path by walking. And I think that the worst thing that we could do right now would be to give up on the project. Um, so with that, unless there's parting words from Bryn or Lucy or Alice. 
just going to jump in. I think we probably have time for one more question. We're at one fifty-five, so we probably have a few more minutes if there's one more question. If we run out of time, Kirsty, it's definitely your fault now. I was trying to keep this nice and tight. As um, you're identifying that last question, I'll just jump in and say, I think it's really important that while we come up, we, we imagine and come up with our new narrative, we also have to call bullshit on the bullshit out there because um, we can't let the fossil fuels industry get away uh, with, you know, or the gas industry get, get away with the lie that somehow there's going to be all these jobs in a gas-fired recovery. I mean, it's totally nonsensical. It will just be the enrichment of a, of a few rich people um, so and a few rich corporations. Um, we need to make sure that we don't let them get away with coal, with, with, with saying that uh, gas is a clean fuel. I mean, there are, uh, we, we, we do need to directly engage with the counter narratives. We also, I just want to remind um, everyone that this is, uh, we, we, we tend to get sucked into the fossil fuels vortex when we talk about these things, but um, there are all of these other narratives going on around, you know, um, when they talk about opening Sydney up 24 hours a day to say that, you know, well, people of course can't get paid penalty rates for working in the middle of the night. Like those things are really, really important too. We, you know, we can't leave anyone behind. Um, uh, as we go into the next phase and, and we just need to watch what, the, what corporate Australia is doing a, a across all of those different spheres. Um, look, we're, we've got four minutes. Does anyone have a question? I'm looking through the chat. I can see mostly great ideas for our new slogan and I'm not seeing a tight question here that we can pick up in four minutes. Pop it in the chat quick if you've got one. Great. I think, Kirsty, I'm overruling you. We are done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Saffron. And so great to have so many um, questions and comments in the chat. I'd love to say a massive thank you to Bryn O'Brien, Alice Drury, Lucy Mann and Saffron Zoma. It was great to see such a um, powerhouse of a panel and great to see so many um, great people here today being part of the conversation. Over the last few weeks, we've had many conversations from how this crisis is affecting um, people seeking asylum and refugees, gambling, housing, um, First Nations people and health. And we don't solve any of those problems without dealing with this um, massive challenge, which is how corporate interests are kind of warping our democracy to line their pockets and and shape the policies of today around their interests rather than the community interests. So thank you so much to all of you for sharing your insights and the great work you're doing. And today we'll have um, an email sent out with a bunch of the links that were shared. So if any of the organisations or any of the people on the call have any links you'd like to get shared around, please do that now. We'll send you that and a survey. Otherwise, we've got um, Australia Home Every Day, weekday, 1 till 2 p.m. And tomorrow we have a session with Peter Lewis from Essential and Catherine Murphy from The Guardian talking about the weekly um, Essential poll, where the community is at and understanding how people are faring. Um, and then next week we have a session on over-policing next Monday. So that'll be a really fascinating um, look at a kind of a, a related issue, um, how the state is responding to this crisis and who's being most affected by the expansion of police powers. So um, there's lots of interesting conversations going on. So um, look forward to seeing you all here another lunchtime. Otherwise, thank you so much to our presenters. And this is recorded, so we'll send around a link and you can share it with your friends. Otherwise, have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Thanks.